very important to listen. Because if you listen, have ears to listen what the Spirit of God is trying to teach you through the Word, you're going to be blessed. God wants all of his people to be blessed. Amen? All right. The message this morning, I call it the heart of a father. Okay? You're going to find this interesting. Okay? Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, people will have ears to listen today, and it will help them, encourage them, and help them to grow strong in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. When you give your life to Christ, the scripture tells us you become a new creation, correct? We all understand that, right? It means you entered into a new family. All things have passed away and you have become a new creation. This is scripture. God is your heavenly father now. Now, it's a challenge for many people today to relate to a father because many family units are without a father living in the home. And that's true, especially it seems to be getting worse. Now, that makes it much more difficult for people to understand the concept of a father God. Many have never known the love and care of a father Others have known only abuse or neglect from their fathers. True, isn't it? Now, Satan has worked tirelessly to destroy the family unit. That's one of his main aims. In doing so, he spoiled the thinking of young minds about fatherhood. Now listen, God is your heavenly father, and God cares about families, most of all, his own. You need to see yourself here in the family of God now, okay? Do you know what the last two verses in the Old Testament say? Well, I'm going to tell you anyhow. Let me tell you that. I'm reading from Malachi chapter 5, verse 6 to 7, and it says this. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Now, this scripture has got two fulfillments. This prophecy was initially fulfilled after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and John the Baptist prepared the way. The Bible says that John the Baptist ministered in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Now, Luke 1, verse 17 tells us, He, John the Baptist, will also go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, the ultimate fulfillment of this passage will occur in the last days when God will send Elijah to prepare the way for his second coming. Malachi said that a return to God would result in a restoration of family love. Now, Jesus revealed the love of God the Father to God's people, didn't he? All right? Now, when you and I were born again, we didn't become God's servants. We became his children. You became his children. I want you to remember that. You are the children of God. Okay? And because of that, we gained access to a glorious inheritance, one that we don't have to wait until we get to heaven to receive it. Now, keep listening because you have an inheritance. Now, remember when the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. Jesus began his prayer with two simple words. Our Father. You like that? Our Father. Our Father in heaven. That's in Matthew 6, verse 9, all right? Notice he didn't say, my Father. He didn't just say, your Father. He said, our Father. Okay? Now, in so doing, he made a statement about those of us who would become born-again 
children of God. He declared us to be the sons of God just as much as he, Jesus, is the Son of God. Now, in those two words, Jesus actually proclaimed that we have the same spiritual heritage he has. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you receive God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. Now the Jews under the old covenant never addressed God as Abba. Abba was a term that the children used when they addressed their fathers. Abba, okay? Now, let's look at this passage of Scripture. Galatians 4, verse 4 to 7. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Amen? Now we are no longer a servant, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. Right? Now the Apostle Paul was especially aware of this revelation of our sonship in the kingdom of God. Because in Acts 26, during his encounter with Jesus, remember, on the road to Damascus, the Lord specifically told him, he said this, For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen, of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people, as well as from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you, to open their eyes, in order to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Now, in other words, Jesus was telling Paul, I want them to know their sins have been forgiven. I want them to know the devil does not have any more power over them anymore. I want them to know that they have an inheritance. Now, think on this. What good is such a glorious inheritance if you and I have never received it? Hmm? Paul told believers at Ephesus the same thing he wrote to the Galatians. But he added in Ephesians 1 verse 5 and verse 11, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Now the revelation that Paul had was that you and I do not have to wait to receive our inheritance after we die and go to heaven. Our inheritance went into effect when Jesus died and rose from the dead. Jesus is the only man ever to write a will, die, then come back from the grave and officially validate his own will. That's, that's a pretty good thing, isn't it? It's a brilliant thing. Even at this very moment, Jesus is watching over that will, the new covenant bought by his blood. Seeing to it that every letter, every detail of it is kept for our benefit. We have obtained redemption. It's time we realized our full identity as sons and daughters of Almighty God. It's time we receive what is rightfully ours. It's time that we took hold of our full inheritance now. That was the purpose for Jesus' life, death and resurrection. We know that when Adam disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, he fell from his rightful place. Consequently then, sin and death were introduced to the world. However, 
praise God for this, God had a backup plan, okay? That plan was to restore man to his rightful place of sonship with God. Adam possessed everything he could have ever wanted. He was given authority to rule and reign over all of God's handiwork. Unfortunately, things changed when sin entered the picture, didn't it? All right? Now, that's where Jesus comes in. It tells us in 1 John 3, 8, For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy, what? The works of the devil. Jesus was born to destroy the devil's works, which included sin, sickness, poverty, and spiritual death. Luke 4.18 tells us, Jesus shed his blood so that you and I could live free from the works of the devil. Because of his death and resurrection, a poor man doesn't have to be poor anymore. A sick man doesn't have to be sick anymore. A blind man doesn't have to be blind anymore. Jesus died for us so that we could have an opportunity to be born again and live the good life that God predestined us to live. We get this new life, not by dying physically, but by Jesus dying. And we believe it and accepted it. And now he's created, your spirit has come alive to him because you're born again, a new creature in Christ Jesus. Now, religion tends to tell us we're not worthy all the time. You've done this wrong. You've done that wrong. Look, they've gone too far, much too far. God didn't invent religion. God invented faith. And he wanted us to believe him. God's word is true. Amen? You never feel worthy if you're in some kind of religious cult. You're always in bondage. Now, Jesus' resurrection guarantees us the right to be made righteous and be restored to our rightful place as sons of God in right standing with him. And because those who are saved have been declared righteous, God completely wipes the slate clean when it comes to our sins. You've got to believe that. I mean, people are in bondage because of things where they've made mistakes and done wrong things. Acts 13, 39 says, Through Jesus, everyone who believes, acknowledges Jesus as his Savior and devotes himself to him is absolved, cleared, freed from every charge. That's good to know, isn't it? He's cleared you of them. Now you say, oh, that's too much. Yeah, praise God it is, else you'd never go to heaven. And he's done it past, present, future because you will make some more mistakes, all right? But less, I hope, all right? Now, as far as heaven is concerned, please remember this. We're not guilty of sinning against the Father anymore. In Hebrews 10, 7, it says, Jesus said the whole reason for his being was to do the will of the Father. So when you and I were born again, we didn't become God's servants either. We became his children. We became children of the King, sons and daughters of the Most High God. And because of that, we gained access to a glorious inheritance, one that we don't have to wait until heaven to receive. Today, however, though, most of the church is not walking in and enjoying the fullness of its rightful inheritance. All the blessings that are promised to us. Now, the reason we're not is because many do not understand their true identity. They haven't received their sonship in the kingdom of God. Now, when it comes to an inheritance, we've all probably heard the story of the prodigal son. I'm sure you've probably heard that if you've been around church for a while. Now, the parable begins in Luke chapter 15, verse 11 to 16. Now, I want to use this. It's very important this morning, even though you've heard this before. A certain man had two sons. And the younger one of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, 
journeyed to a far country, and there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went, joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him in the fields to feed swine. So it wasn't Israel, was it? And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Now, it was the youngest son who went to his father and asked for his inheritance, right? But notice how this bold request didn't seem to upset the father in the least. After the father divided his holdings, gave the youngest son what was rightfully his, the first thing this young man did with his newfound wealth was to go looking for a good time. Consequently, his riotous living came to an end in a pig pen. He began to come to his senses. Then he came up with a plan, which we find in verses 18 to 19. He said, I will arise, go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. See, the son finally realized that his father's servants were better off than he was. So if he could just go back home, humble himself, he'd be happy to be a servant. But when the prodigal son went home, his father met him before he even made it back to the house. The repentant son confessed his error, told his father how wrong he had been, and how unworthy he was to be called a son. But then, before the son could throw himself at his father's mercy, the father said in verses 22 to 24, bring forth the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, he's alive again, he was lost and he's found. Now I want you to notice something here. Please notice this. Here's the son working up enough courage to ask his father if he can come back home and live as one of his servants. But when he, the prodigal son, came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, yet I perish with hunger, in verse 17. Now when the father looked a great way off, he wasn't looking to make his long lost son into a servant, he had servants. What he wanted was a restored relationship with his son. But the prodigal son never got his opportunity to become a servant. Before he knew what had happened, he was wearing a robe, a ring, and was sitting down to a feast in honor. He was welcomed back. That meant he was back in the family. He was a son once again. Now, Jesus could have ended the parable there, but he didn't. It was only half the story. The rest of the story is in Luke 15, verse 25 to 30. Let me just read you that. It's the part about the other son. Now, his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry. He wouldn't go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and he said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. Now first notice that while all the celebrating was going on, the eldest son was out in the fields. Now this is an important detail because Jesus is trying to get something over to us about the attitude of these two sons. When the eldest son finally arrived on the scene to the sounds of merrymaking, and found out what had happened, he was very upset. That's when his true heart and mindset were revealed. 
He told his father in verse 29, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. Now here's the elder thinking like a servant. Thinking like a servant, acting like a servant, and talking like one. All the while, everything is his father that his father owns, including all the servants, belong to him. Now in Luke 15, 31, the father said to him, Son, you are always with me. All that I have is yours. Both were sons, weren't they? Yet his sons were acting more like servants. Both had a position, an inheritance, but neither one took his rightful place as a son. Okay? Neither of them truly stepped into the inheritance as a son. The father had given them their inheritance, but neither one received it in honor. The younger son took his and he spent it in dishonor. The older son never recognized the fact that all his father had was really his. Likewise, the father in Jesus' parable, God is wanting sons and I'll add daughters, okay? Hebrews 2.10 tells us, God for whom and through whom everything was made chose to bring many sons into glory. Now listen, if we are born again, you and I truly are the sons and the daughters of Almighty God. Please get that into your spirit. You know, did you all have perfect family backgrounds? Or was there problems at times? Now, for the most part, the problem is that we've been thinking and speaking and acting more like servants than sons. I'm not saying we're not supposed to serve God. No, I'm simply drawing attention to what Jesus revealed as wrong thinking on the part of the prodigal son and his brother. It's one thing to know you're the son of the Most High God and act that way. It's another matter I have to cry out to go and say, Oh Lord, I'm so unworthy of your love and grace. But Lord, you know how hard I work as your humble servant down here. Listen, God is not trying to keep anything good from us. Look, I don't know about you, but I remember when I got saved, I thought, oh, I began to understand Jesus, but Father, God Father, that didn't mean a great deal to me. Because I realized I didn't have a good relationship with either mother or father. I was on the streets when I was 17, I left them. Amen? I understand what I'm trying to tell you. It's very, very important. God is not trying to keep anything from us. Amen? He's doing everything he can to get it to us. Listen, when you have a revelation of that, you can approach God with boldness. God responds well when we do because Hebrews eleven six says, boldness requires faith, and faith pleases him. Then Hebrews four sixteen tells us, come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Now, before you can ever be bold with the Lord, you must understand first what the Bible has to say about his relationship with you as a born-again believer. A real relationship between two people requires communion. It requires fellowship and communication. It requires spending time with one another. For you to develop and have a genuine boldness before God, you must know him intimately. All right? You must be comfortable with him and secure in your fellowship with him. Your heart must not condemn you in his presence. That's the way we should be with our heavenly father. We should be bold when we come before him, not just because we have a legal right to be there according to the word, but because we have a deep and intimate relationship with him. Now, there's only one way to acquire that kind of relationship, and that's to spend time with him. At least give him 15 minutes. If you started with that, before long, it'll be half an hour. Every day. Sometime in the day. 
I, I'm always happy when the football season's finished because then you can have more time. Well. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, you know what it is? Things take our time, don't they? Interests, different things, your family, whatever. But you've got to try and make the effort, though, to give some time, all right? If we begin to do that as individuals, and especially as a church, our prayers, instead of being unsure, hesitant at times, will be bolder than ever before, and they will bring answers from God. Amen? There are many promises in the Word of God. And God wants you to live in health and prosperity while you're here on this earth. Now! But if you're going to walk in the fullness of what God has promised us, you're going to have to understand what your position is as a member of the body of Christ. Amen? And that authority that that position carries, there is a big authority goes with it. Now, and you're going to have to understand that relationship you have with God. Again, not only is God your Lord, but he is your Father. And as your Father, the Scripture says, he has blessed you with all spiritual blessings. That's Ephesians 1 verse 3. Paul wrote these words to the church that he established at Ephesus. Paul saw the saw that the church needed better understanding of their position in Christ and their rights and their privileges. Now, when you understand your inheritance as a child of God, you will not have any problems believing God for your needs. You'll see that you've got a total change of status. You don't have to be like the older brother in the prodigal son story anymore. You've been prepared for something special. You've been equipped for supernatural living on this earth now, before Jesus comes back. Now look at that verse again. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Notice it refers to God as Father. That means God is your father. God is your father. Now, the question is, how does a father treat his children? Generally speaking, all right? Well, Matthew 7, 11 tells us, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who's in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Hmm? That's a father's heart. He wants nothing more than to give good things to his children. Seeing God as your father brings you into a place where there's an inheritance waiting for you. Once you reach that place, it's easy to believe for those things that you desire in the natural. Healing. Long life. Peace. Peace. House, car, whatever you need. We always have some needs. They're all yours to have because they've already been given to you in heavenly places. God's got the supply. You have to ask, claim it, speak by faith, believe it. And you can have it. Oh, but I'm not good enough. Stop thinking Negative things. Start to get positive in your life. Have you noticed most people that are very successful in life, they have pioneered something. They've spent days, months, some years to become the head and not the tail. But they get there. That means we all have the ability. People have done that without God too. Imagine with Christ in you, encouraging you, showing the way. All right? Philippians 2, verse 5 to 6 says this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Well, the Bible says in Romans 8, verse 17, we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. You're a joint heir with Christ. That means we are equal with Jesus in all that he's inherited from God the Father. Does that blow you away? 
Well, that's the truth. That's God's word. God doesn't lie. He's trying to tell you you've got an inheritance. Hmm. Now, if you are in the form of God, that tells me we should be thinking like God. You can speak things out of a godly or spiritual standpoint and see them happen because your words, if you're really in God and you have faith, what do they do? They carry God's power. Words carry power. If you're operating in faith and the knowledge and the understanding of your inheritance in Christ Jesus, this earthly system you live in has to obey you. It's hard to see it like that. All right? The Bible tells me you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, and I could add you're a king too, and a priest. You're everything. But it goes on to say that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, 1 Peter 2, 9. Aren't you glad you've been pulled out of darkness? Amen. Amen. As believers then see it, we have kingship with the Father. We are supposed to be reigning now on this earth. But that can only happen when we have spiritual knowledge of our position and the authority that we possess, but we have to act on it. That's where faith comes in. Believes, acts. Amen? Now, God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings and privileges. I mean, I'm not making this up. This is the word of God I'm giving you. I've never preached religion in my life. I didn't even want to hear it first time I went to a church. Everything has been freely given to us, including wealth, health, peace, joy. Some people just don't want to walk in the blessings. They would rather use their own limited resources, go their own way, rather than depend on God who declared himself their father. I just can ask you a question. How many of you respected your father? You may, know, you may have had problems at times, but how many of you really did respect your father? Is there anybody here? Generally, you did, don't you? We like to respect our father. Well, amen. Then he didn't want you just going your own way. Now, you know, because he was your father, he probably wanted you to go in a good way, didn't he? And encourage you. And if he was in a position, he probably helped you and financed you in certain things. Now, it's very important that we are not negative and, you know, we're not believing in this father we've got now, the new father. Don't be like that because you can easily find yourself in a position of a beggar, going to God, pleading your case, rather than asking God as his child and receiving because most of you are pleasing, trying to please God to get something when you're desperate. You should be able to walk into God and say, Father, I need healing in my body. Thank you, Father, I receive it. I'm going to walk in health. You so condition, you believe everything a doctor tells you, they're not God. They do their best, I know. They're trying to help you and they do help people. But understand what I'm saying here. You've got a God that knows everything about you and your circumstances and all you have to do is start speaking his answers. He's written it all out in the Bible. There's something there for every need you have. Hmm? See, we don't have to be begging and pleading God. That's what I think of whenever I think about the story of the blind man who stopped Jesus on the way to Jericho. He wasn't a believer But the situation was the same. In Luke 18.35, it says, And it came to pass that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. Now, that's how most Christians who don't know their rights and privileges are. They're acting more like beggars than sons. You don't have to beg God, for he's already provided for you. He's your father. You know what the Bible calls him? Abba Father. Maybe you should say that in your prayers for a few times. Because it's not like it's your father. 
is your father. That's something. Abba Father. You have a covenant with him that is sealed by the blood of Jesus. Healing is your right under that covenant. You shouldn't be poor and struggling to pay your bills. I mean, you saw those two pictures up there today, didn't you? Venezuela, when I went there, was a religious system. Can you see now they're a faith system? That's how it should be. And we've become a religious system in the Western world too. And that means nothing really. If you don't have faith, you've got nothing. Faith is belief, trust in Almighty God. God's word is truth. Acted on, it brings results. You shouldn't be poor, struggling all the time, paying your bills. You may have gone through some tough times. I'm sure we all have. But if you believe God, you can speak your way out of it. It might take some time and some changes in your life, but God's word works. See? People struggle just to pay their bills. People are worried sick in our country now about rates going up. Everything's going up. No. See? You need to stop and say this. I am blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus now. Even if like the prodigal son, you feel far away from your heavenly father or you feel that you've disappointed him. Look, don't despair. He reassures you, you have not lost your position of sonship. In your father's house, you not only come under his complete protection, but you also enjoy his rich provisions and unconditional love. And that's the truth. He's a father to you. Now think of that seriously. I'm not just saying that to make a statement. That's what he is. You've got to start seeing that. Gosh, God who created the universe, everything in it, has control of everything. He's sending Jesus back for us shortly. Thing called the rapture. We're going to heaven. Guess what he's made in heaven? A mansion for you. There would be nothing on this earth like the mansion he's got for you. I'm telling you now. Don't you worry about what you leave behind. Leave it behind. It wouldn't qualify for what you're getting in the new Jerusalem one day. A mansion designed by God over the last 2,000 years. You think about that. Be, oh, I speak to some Christian. Oh, you know. I was, well, we could have a few more years. What do you want a few more years with the devil for? He's the God of this world till Jesus comes back with us and gets him and puts him in the place he belongs, hell. That's what he's created for him. For you, it's heaven. So, don't panic. Don't wonder what on earth is going to happen. God is in control. If you read your Bible, he wins, and we win with him. Amen? And if you happen to get there quicker than us, well, praise God. You won't want to come back either. You'll be quite happy there. All right? God is good all the time. Just read the word, and you will get stronger and powerful in faith. God wants faithful people, and I'm telling you, the message for God for all Christians worldwide is this, believe in him.